Our story unfolds in Iceland, right in the midst of a massive volcano erupting with terrifying power. This fiery eruption brings chaos to the beautiful town of Vik, covering it in layers of ash. The once picturesque town is now hidden beneath a thick blanket of destruction, forcing its people to escape, but not everyone leaves. Amidst the turmoil, a group of determined scientists remains committed to uncovering the volcano's secrets. Alongside them are a few resilient locals, deeply connected to their home, who refuse to abandon it. Despite the overwhelming disaster, these brave souls stay behind, united by a common purpose, to peel away the mysteries hidden beneath the ash and reveal the truth about Vic's darkest hours. Amidst this turmoil, we meet Grima, a denizen of Vic, who, upon awaking, reaches for her medication to wrestle with the weight of her depression. She embarks on a somber drive through the desolate streets, her car radio echoing the grim reality narrated by a somber announcer. Desperate for a glimmer of hope, she reaches out to Gisli, the town's venerable policeman, who confirms the grim situation. He alludes to the tireless scientific endeavors underway of the glacier huts, hinting at the potential salvation these efforts may hold. Returning home, Grima is visited by her father, Thor. He observes her preoccupation with the city's deteriorating conditions, the ash-covered landscape, and the loss of her older sister, Asa, who disappeared about a year ago and was presumed dead. A monument has been erected in the cemetery to commemorate Eusa's disappearance. Thor advises Grima to leave the city, but she is reluctant to do so. During their conversation, Thor notices that Grima holds onto belongings that belong to her missing sister and her deceased mother, who took her own life when Grima was a child. In Reykjavik, Derry, a diligent scientist, meticulously tracks the incoming samples from Vic. His keen awareness of the situation's gravity fuels his dedication. Engaging in a conversation with a fellow scientist, they delve into the peculiar ash samples mysteries. Its distinctiveness piques Derry's curiosity, compelling him to embark on a journey to Vic for a more profound investigation. To further his quest for answers, Derry reaches out to his friend Aja, another scientist stationed in Vic. He communicates the details of the enigmatic ash sample and his intent to visit. Aja, ever hospitable, extends an invitation for him to stay at their hut, generously offering an available room. In the midst of the volcanic chaos, a chilling encounter befalls Aja and her boyfriend, Lifer. As they peer through the ash-choked air, a figure emerges from the desolation, shrouded in an eerie aura of despair. It's a woman, a spectral apparition, her naked form caked in a grotesque layer of mud, a spectral wraith from the ash-laden abyss. Haunted by the inexplicable sight, Aja and Lifer summon their courage, and driven by a mixture of compassion and morbid curiosity, lead her into the flickering sanctuary of their home. The woman's presence exudes an unnatural chill, a stark reminder of the volcanic tempest that rages outside. In this eerie tableau, the couple attempts to unravel the mystery of this wretched visitor, their world irrevocably altered by the enigma that now dwells within their midst. The narrative unfolds with several intriguing developments. Grima makes her way to a local hotel, where she encounters Bergren, the new manager who possesses a talent for reading tarot cards. During her visit, Grima receives a phone call from Gisli, who informs her about the discovery of the woman found on the ice. Within the confines of Gisli's home, an air of melancholy hang heavy, intermingling with the ashen veil that cloaked their once vibrant town. The doctor's footsteps echo through the dimly lit corridor, a regular visitor who bore grim tidings. Each visit brings a stark reminder of the relentless march of time, etching lines of suffering on Magnus' frail face. The battle against lung cancer has become an arduous journey, and the insidious ash from the nearby volcano only exacerbated her fragile condition. It settles like a shroud over their lives, choking the very air they breathed. In the midst of despair, Gisli's frustration simmers, a silent plea for his wife to heed the doctor's urgent advice. 
He has beseeched her countless times to abandon their beloved city, an act of love and survival. Yet Magnea's steadfast resolve remains unyielding, bound to the place that holds a lifetime of memories. Their home bears witness to this emotional turmoil, a sanctuary tainted by the inevitability of impending loss. The doctor's words are a relentless drumbeat, a reminder of the choices that lay before them. And in the heart of this turmoil, Gisli grapples with his helplessness, a husband torn between love and the inexorable march of fate. Determined to check on the mysterious woman, Gisli and Grima embark on their journey. However, they encounter new ground cracks along the way, forcing them to alter their route. Despite these obstacles, they finally reach the woman, identified as Gunhild, from Sweden. Gunhild mentions a tourist guide named Thor, leaving Grima puzzled as her father Thor has long ceased working as a tour guide. Subsequently, they transport Gunhild to the hospital, where the attending doctor recommends she remain there until her body temperature stabilizes. Nevertheless, Gunhild insists on returning to her job at the Vic Hotel. Thor becomes aware of the woman's presence and decides to visit her at the hospital. Upon seeing her, Gunhild recognizes Thor. However, his reaction is one of fear, and he hastily departs without uttering a word. Intrigued by the situation, Gisli decides to inquire about Gunhild at the hotel, where he discovers that she did indeed work there but two decades ago. Meanwhile, Thor stands outside his home and stumbles upon a deceased crow with a unique white feather. Puzzled by this discovery, he proceeds to bury the crow in front of his house. Bergrun, the hotel manager, pays a visit to the hospital to meet Gunhild. However, she struggles to recognize the woman's features. In an attempt to gather more information, she consults old hospital records, finding evidence that Gunheld worked at the hotel during a period when her mother served as the manager. Additionally, Gunhild appears to be the same age now as she was during that time. Growing increasingly suspicious, Gisli feels compelled to take action. With determination in his heart, he reaches for his phone and dials the address in Sweden, hoping for clarity. As the phone rings, a young voice answers on the other end, belonging to none other than Björ, Gunhild's son. In their conversation, Björ casually mentions that his mother is currently absent, engrossed in her shopping endeavors. This seemingly mundane detail sends shivers down Gisli's spine, adding weight to his mounting concerns. It now appears highly likely that the enigmatic woman they have encountered in Iceland is, in fact, impersonating Gunnild. The plot thickens, and Gisli's quest for the truth intensifies, driving him further into the heart of this perplexing mystery. In the dim twilight, Thor's residence stands in eerie silence, disrupted only by the incessant cawing of a crow that seems to defy the natural order. Its ominous presence is far from ordinary, for as Thor peers through his window, a shiver courses down his spine. This crow, which he had once solemnly laid to rest, now defies death's grasp by returning in a haunting duplication. The strangeness of this surreal spectacle deepens the enigma that has enveloped the narrative, casting a chilling atmosphere that clings to every word. As the story unfolds, the unsettling presence of duality among certain characters continues to unravel, leaving an indelible mark of suspense and intrigue that both the characters and readers could not escape. Continuing with the unfolding events, Grima decides to dial Gunhild's number in Sweden. Coincidentally, Gunhild returns home, and a conversation ensues between her and the mysterious woman, who claims not to know anyone other than Thor. This perplexes Gunhild, leaving her deeply unsettled, and she hastily ends the call. The events of the day weigh heavily on her mind, preventing her from finding any rest. It's evident that something profoundly disturbing from her past is haunting her thoughts. After much contemplation, Gunhild makes a life-altering decision to journey to Vik in Iceland to investigate the matter firsthand. She imparts a word of caution to her son, instructing him to seek assistance from their neighbors if needed. When her son inquires about her anticipated return, 
She assures him that she'll be back as soon as possible. Shifting scenes, we find Grima at the scientific campsite, diligently monitoring updates on the volcanic ash. An unexpected sound catches her attention, originating from a nearby hut. To her astonishment, she discovers her sister, who had mysteriously disappeared a year ago, is now covered in ash. The narrative then takes us back to the recent past, when the two sisters were part of a rescue team. During a snowstorm, the team responded to a distress call and used ice skates to reach the site. Upon completing their mission, they realized that Disa had gone missing and their exhaustive search efforts proved futile. Returning to the present, we witness Isa, who has no recollection of her past and is bewildered by the sparse population of the town. Overwhelmed, she faints, prompting her sister Grema to rush her to the hospital. The town's residents are increasingly perplexed by the strange and inexplicable occurrences unfolding around them. Meanwhile, Derry discusses his impending trip to Vic with his wife, Rachel, hinting at their deteriorating marital relationship, particularly following the tragic loss of their son, Michael, in an accident. Derry expresses his urgency and promises to address the topic of divorce upon his return. Upon arriving in Vic, Derry is welcomed by his friend Aja and her boyfriend, who provide him with accommodations at their home. Just Lee visits Isa, attempting to question her about her disappearance, but she can only recall getting lost from the rescue team. The doctor is equally baffled, suggesting the possibility of her being kidnapped during that time. In a touching and profoundly emotional moment, Hisa's father finds himself utterly overwhelmed by the staggering revelation that his beloved daughter, once thought lost forever, is miraculously alive. In a rush of uncontainable joy and relief, he sweeps her into his arms, clinging to her with a depth of emotion words cannot adequately capture. Asa, standing before her family, is equally taken aback by the tidal wave of emotions that wash over them all. The immense concern, the palpable excitement, and the overwhelming love emanating from her family engulf her, leaving her stunned by the sheer intensity of their collective emotions. In that poignant instance, their hearts beat as one, and a profound sense of reunion and connection fills the air. It's a moment where time seems to stand still, and the bonds of family are renewed with a depth that only adversity can forge. Simultaneously, the doctor checks on Gunhild, assuring her of her child's well-being. Gunhild, aware of her pregnancy and Thor's role as the father, keeps this information to herself. In the meantime, the original Gunhild arrives in the city and crosses the river on a ferry. Gisli, who receives her, begins to suspect that the other woman is her sister due to their striking similarities. Lastly, Derry shares his intention with a scientist friend to obtain a sample from the 1918 volcanic eruption for analysis, hinting at further developments in the story. In the hospital, we get to know that Issa is discharged, and her sister Grima, joyfully, embraces her as they leave. During their journey, they catch up on current events in the city and reminisce about their shared memories. The original Gunheld opts to stay at the hotel and encounters the manager, Bergren, who attempts to glean some information about her life and background, but only manages to obtain her name. Gunheild inquires about renting a car and learns that she can take any of the parked cars outside, as the townspeople have left their vehicles behind. Gisli shares the news of Issa's discovery with his son Einar, who appears to be genuinely pleased, possibly due to his feelings for Asa and the impact of her disappearance on him. However, Einar is perplexed by the circumstances of her disappearance and her sudden return after a year. Issa makes her way to her father's house, where she stumbles upon the obituary written for her, leading to a surge of emotions. She discovers the memorial dedicated to her in the cemetery, right next to her mother's grave. A crow, the same one Thor found alive after burying it, stands on her designated grave, forging a mysterious connection with Isa. In the hospital, Gunhild pays a visit to her doppelganger, noting their striking resemblance. She also learns that the enigmatic woman is pregnant, 
which triggers memories of her own pregnancy with Thor's child two decades ago. At that time, Gunheld contemplated aborting the child, but ultimately chose not to. The revelation dawns that Bjorn is Thor's child, unbeknownst to both Thor and Bjorn himself. Gunheild is deeply intrigued and moved by this woman who evokes memories from her past. Gunhild decides to pay Thor a visit to his farm. Thor is taken aback by her sudden appearance, and though he may still harbor feelings for her, he manages to restrain them. Gunhild reveals her reason for returning to the city, explaining that the mysterious woman claims to be pregnant with his child, a revelation that leaves Thor stunned and questioning how such a situation could occur when he has no recollection of her. Bergren checks on Magnia's health and delves into the history of the city, recounting the eruption of the volcano in 1311 and the eerie tales of the dead returning to life. It was believed that malevolent spirits had possessed these resurrected bodies. Intriguingly, during a cup reading, Bergren stumbles upon a chilling revelation in the horoscope, leaving her in a state of terror. Returning to the sisters at their father's house, Ace's visible upset at finding Gunheld seated next to their father creates an awkward atmosphere. Gunheld feels embarrassed and uneasy in the face of Ace's clear discomfort. Meanwhile, in the remote hut, Derry senses a slight movement behind him. To his astonishment, he discovers his son Michael, albeit covered in mud. Derry conceals Michael from others and provides him with food, but despite his elation at seeing his son alive, he watches in disbelief as Michael dies before his eyes. Michael, for his part, has no memory of the events during his disappearance. During this period, Aja and her boyfriend embark on a mission to retrieve the volcano sample Derry requested. As for the two sisters, Grima, overjoyed at Issa's return, senses an underlying strangeness, given her sister's total lack of memory regarding the past year. Grima's husband, Curtin, advises her to set aside these concerns and simply revel in her sister's safe return. In another part of town, Derry initiates a series of questions to confirm his son's identity, and Michael responds correctly, leaving little doubt that he is indeed his father's son. As Grima and Issa converse, Grima inquires about Issa's reaction upon seeing Gunnail dining with their father. Issa reveals that in the past, she witnessed her father's infidelity with Gunnail, but due to Grima's young age at the time, she kept this painful truth from her sister. After Issa's disappearance, Grima struggled with a nervous breakdown, and during therapy, she was advised to accept her sister's death. Later, Grima leaves for work, and upon returning home, she discovers Issa missing. Frantic, she searches for her and eventually finds her at their childhood play spot. There, Grima scolds Issa for disregarding their family's concerns, but Tisse explains that she simply wanted to relive moments from their childhood. Tisse then leads her sister to Magnia's closed laundromat, where they clandestinely borrow swimsuits. They go for a swim, indulging in the pleasure of the moment. During this time, Grima's thoughts drift to her mother's suicide, causing her to, abruptly, leave the water. Back at the hut, Derry waits until Michael falls asleep then relocates him to an adjacent room and locks him inside. The child pleads with his father to release him, but Derry remains resolute. Exhausted, Derry nods off while sitting near the door. Inside, Michael searches for an escape route and manages to lift a wooden floorboard, uncovering a potential exit. Desperate, he dials a number on an emergency phone found in the room. On the other end, his mother answers, and the recognition of her son's voice leaves her in shock. She hangs up abruptly, struggling to process the unbelievable reality. Michael persists in his escape attempt, successfully moving a wooden plank from the floor. In the meantime, Derry awakens to the sound of a disturbance and investigates, only to find the power line severed. While Ivor ventures out to inspect the power outage, Derry heads to the room and discovers his son hiding inside. As these events unfold, Rachel attempts to reach her husband to discuss the strange occurrence, but he remains unresponsive. 
ultimately ending the call. Grima awakens and informs her husband of her intention to take Issa to the cabin at the glacier. She expresses her desire to uncover the reasons behind her sister's year-long disappearance. He said perceives that her sister's husband feels uncomfortable with her presence in the house. When she inquires about his discomfort, Kiartan shares his concerns about the impact of Issa's absence on their relationship. He describes how Grema's emotional state is closely tied to Issa's presence or absence, and how their marital dynamics have been affected. Meanwhile, Issa, feeling a pang of regret, but understanding her limited influence over these inexplicable changes, watched as the unsettling events unfolded around her. In another part of this tale, Derry, seeking refuge in his son's room, concealed him from prying eyes. The young boy's trust eroded after the night of confinement, making sleep an elusive visitor. Simultaneously, Rachel reaches out to Derry, her voice trembling with the weight of her recent phone call, bridging the gap between their separate, disquieted lives. In this vulnerable exchange, Derry, burdened by the growing strangeness, confided in her, sharing the harrowing tale of his son's reappearance. Together, with shared uncertainty, they decided to rendezvous at a city hotel, a place ill-suited for the arrival of a child amidst these bewildering circumstances, eliciting curious stares from passersby. Upon arriving at the hotel, Michael rushes into his mother's arms, leaving her overwhelmed by his unexpected presence. The couple discusses the inexplicable situation they find themselves in. Derry recalls the traumatic memories of the accident, vividly describing the gruesome injuries sustained by his child. He expresses disbelief at the reality of his son being alive. For Rachel, the most important thing is having her child back, regardless of the mystery surrounding his return. As Michael sleeps, the couple continues their conversation. Derry mentions that he questioned his son about certain events, but noticed peculiar changes in his personality. Michael recounted past incidents without emotional attachment, unlike his previous self. Derry particularly recalls the story of a bird Michael accidentally killed, noticing his son's detached demeanor. They also reminisce about an incident where Michael set fire to his school before the accident, driven by his dislike for it. Rachel defended her son at the time, twisting the situation in his favor. Derry sensed something amiss but chose not to confront the issue. Despite their doubts and reservations, Rachel remains primarily focused on the miracle of her son's return. Meanwhile, Gunhild, the duplicate, is discharged from the hospital. Her first act is to visit Thor's home. Upon her arrival, she encounters the original Gunhild in the kitchen, on the verge of discussing their son with Thor. However, she hesitates and steps back. In the midst of this, the mysterious Gunhild interjects, inquiring about their daughter and alluding to events from two decades ago. The original Gunhild is deeply unsettled by the mysterious woman's knowledge and suspects that Thor may have divulged their past to her. Puzzled by the situation, Thor finds himself strangely drawn to the enigmatic Gunhild as she stirs memories of his youth from that era. The two sisters decide to visit the hut at the glacier. During their journey, Asa notices Grema taking pills and learns that they are for her depression, which began after Asa's disappearance. Asa feels remorse, especially as she recalls her mother taking similar pills before her suicide. Upon reaching the hut, they discover a loose wooden plank on the floor. As Issa delves further into the abyss concealed beneath the cabin, a growing unease begins to tighten its grip on her. Each step seems to reverberate through the very heart of her fear, echoing in the cold, dimly lit chamber. The shadows dance with sinister intent, playing a macabre symphony of dread. In the depths of that foreboding darkness, she encounters a sight that would haunt her waking hours, a sight so unsettling that it robs her of words. Frozen in her tracks, she struggles to comprehend the grim tableau before her. Above the ground, Grima stands transfixed, her senses overwhelmed by the palpable tension in the air. With trepidation coursing through her veins, she, too, feels compelled to descend into the yawning chasm. 
What she beholds there was a chilling masterpiece of time's inexorable cruelty, a tableau of despair etched in ice. Emerging from that subterranean nightmare, Grima's mind swirls with disbelief and confusion, like a tempest that refuses to be quelled. Her gaze settled once more on the woman who now stood before her, shrouded in enigma and framed by the unsettling echoes of the abyss. The unsettling truth of that subterranean chamber had shaken them both to their very core. The police arrived to retrieve the decomposing body for forensic examination, but its identity remains elusive. The two sisters undergo questioning about their activities at the site. Gisli offers to take them home, but Grima, now fearful of Asa, suggests that her sister go to their father's house alone. Upon entering the house, Asa is disconcerted to find her father spending intimate moments with the duplicate Gunhild. It feels like a painful deja vu from 20 years ago. Gunhild acknowledges her presence, but remains silent, prompting Asa to hastily depart. The news of the macabre discovery rippled through the town like an ominous tide. Derry, burdened by a haunting certainty, engaged in a somber conversation with his wife, grappling with the unshakable belief that the lifeless body they had unearthed was not their beloved son. He couldn't ignore the relentless march of time, the inexorable passage from eight to twelve years of age, a journey that should have unfolded in the span of those three long years. Yet the child before them remained eerily frozen, an enigmatic puzzle defying the laws of nature. Firm in his conviction, Derry resolutely declined the notion of bringing the child home. His apprehension pierced through the family's fragile bonds, and his decision was not one he would easily relinquish. Rachel, however, wore her opposition like armor, staunchly refusing to yield to her husband's doubts. In a turbulent moment of desperation, Derry reached out to the authorities, alerting the police to the presence of an unidentified child, a harbinger of an unsettling mystery that would soon enshroud their lives. When the police arrive at the hotel, Rachel learns of her husband's call and decides to flee with the child through the back door, stealing one of the parked cars. Derry pursues them in another vehicle, but his car breaks down. A blizzard sets in, and the air is thick with volcanic ash prompting the residents to remain in their homes for safety. Isa, unable to find shelter, appeals to the hospital for refuge until the next day, but the doctor refuses her request. Gisla contacts Grima, summoning her to his office for an interrogation regarding the corpse. Initially, she appears confused but eventually shares that they discovered a disturbed section of the room's floor. Grima admits her shock upon noticing the striking resemblance between her sister, Isa, and the deceased. As they converse, an alarm rings out from the camp outside. Gisli briefly checks through the window and then resumes the interrogation. He informs Grima that Aja and Trevor are currently at the hotel, which surprises her, as she expected him to take immediate action. Deciding to investigate the situation herself, Grima leaves for the camp. Subsequently, Gisli summons Isa for questioning. Her sister's suspicion deeply disturbs her, leaving her unable to provide any response. Gisli points out that the corpse is dressed identically to what Isa wore when she vanished a year ago. However, she remains speechless, prompting Gisli to suggest waiting for the results of the forensic DNA analysis. Vinar, Gisli's son, happens to be in his father's office during Kesa's interrogation. When Ese invites him to spend time together as they used to, Einar agrees, harboring lingering feelings for her. They venture out to an abandoned house, searching for a drink, and engaging in conversation. He said expresses her discontent with how the townspeople treat her, as though she were a ghost from the past. Ultimately, she decides to head to the hospital, where she hopes to find lodging and the doctor grants a request this time. The storm subsides over the city, and Derry decides to abandon his car in the middle of the road. Hurrying back to the hotel. There, Bergrun intercepts him and reveals that she's observed everything that transpired between him and his wife. She advises him to abandon the child. Then she shares a chilling story from the past. During the eruption of this same volcano in 1625, 
A woman working on a farm had an illicit pregnancy. When she gave birth, she left the child in a remote location. However, the townspeople began noticing that a child appeared in the same spot every year. The mother claimed him each time until one year when she decided to take him home for good. The townspeople warned her that the child was not human but an evil spirit. She raised him as her own until he reached the age of 13 when he killed her in her sleep. Darius is horrified by this tale, seeing parallels between it and his own situation with his wife. Meanwhile, the original Gunheld visits Thor's house and is startled to find the mysterious woman there. Thor explains that she had nowhere to sleep. While they converse, Thor hears a sound from outside and discovers the same crow that had previously died is now alive once more. The original Gunhild realizes that the other woman is gradually assuming her identity and becomes increasingly angry. Their heated discussion escalates, but Thor intervenes, expressing a sense that the two women may somehow be one person, although he can't find a logical or scientific explanation. In the midst of the storm, Rachel pulls over on the roadside. Michael tells her he needs to use the bathroom but she hesitates due to the inclement weather. Michael holds a sharp tool that he pilfered from the hotel. Rachel questions him about the school fire incident, and he admits to being happy about it, as he no longer has to deal with bullies there. He further confesses that he deliberately threw himself in front of the car because he wanted to die. Rachel becomes convinced that this child is not her son and instructs him to leave the car before she returns to the hotel. Grima ventures to the camp, and to her profound shock, encounters her doppelganger covered in mud. Despite her overwhelming fear, Grima decides to bring the other woman along. On the way, she queries her about what happened, but receives no coherent response. Rachel's heart is a heavy stone, burdened with a remorse that threatens to consume her. The stormy night has tested her limits, pushing her to make an agonizing choice, to leave her child in the midst of the tempest while she flees for shelter. She cannot bear the thought of what may have befallen him during those endless hours of howling wind and relentless downpours. As she retraces her steps to the forsaken roadside, the relentless rain still pelts her, an unforgiving reminder of the cruel uncertainty that has gripped her heart. Each footfall in the mud seems to echo with the weight of her worry and the shadows cast by her trembling flashlight dank like mournful specters around her. Every passing second feels like an eternity, her hope waning with every step she takes. The wild elements seem to mock her, whispering their cruel secrets as they rustle through the trees. When she reaches the forlorn spot where she has last seen her son and found only emptiness, her heart sinks to the deepest abyss of despair. In that desolate moment, she clings to the faintest glimmer of hope, her gaze scanning the desolate road, as if willing Michael to appear before her. But it is not her desperate cries that answered her prayers. Instead, it is the kind hearts of strangers, their sympathy for her plight evident, as they found her son in the midst of chaos. Rachel's heart, heavy with guilt and worry, can hardly contain the tumultuous emotions that surged within her. Yet, as the compassionate couple bring Michael back into her trembling embrace, the tears flowed freely from her eyes, mingling with the rain as if nature itself wept tears of relief. The sorrow that has gripped her begins to slowly yield to the warmth of an embrace she has feared she might never experience again. Meanwhile, when Gisli returns home, he is astounded to find his wife, Magnia, in the kitchen, completely healthy and cooking. She appears younger but behaves normally. However, upon entering their bedroom, Gisli discovers his wife lying in bed, terrified by the presence of her doppelganger in the house. Gisli is thrilled to have a woman who seems to replace his suffering with his ailing wife. The mysterious Magnia serves food, but when she brings it to the original Magna, she overturns the dish over her. Gisli notices mud and ash on the doppelganger's clothes, suspecting that she might have experienced the same conditions as Gunnild and Zise. The sick Magnia writes a note and hands it to her husband, which he reads before placing it in his coat pocket. While Gisli takes a shower, the second Magnia tries to retrieve the note from his pocket. 
When he exits the bathroom, he catches her in the act and locks her in the basement of the house while he contemplates how to deal with the situation. The original Gunhild calls her son in Sweden, who shares that he discovered old photos of her with Thor and believes he might be his father due to the timing of her pregnancy. Upon hearing this, Gunhild makes excuses and hangs up. Meanwhile, the doppelganger Gunnell feels exhausted and begins to bleed. Thor rushes her to the hospital, where the doctor assures him that her health is stable but insists she must stay in the hospital overnight. Michael talks to the couple who rescued him from the storm, sharing his fear of returning to his father, Derry, who had locked him in a room. Sympathetic to the child's distress, the couple decides to take him to Reykjavik and report to the police. When Derry and his wife arrive at the scene, they find that the couple has left on a ferry to the other side of the river. The couple had been alarmed by Michael's account of being locked up and planned to take him to the police station to report the situation. Rachel blames Derry for the entire situation and accuses him of abandoning her amid the chaos. During the car ride, Michael becomes anxious about the couple locking him up and attempts to jump out of the moving vehicle. The wife prevents him from doing so to protect his safety. Fearing his fate, Michael retrieves a sharp scalpel and fatally attacks the woman. The husband loses control of the car, which rolls down a steep slope. Michael emerges from the accident unharmed, and upon seeing the still-living man, chooses to abandon him to die. Grima receives a call from Gisli regarding the accident and her assistance with first aid. She leaves a note for her husband, Charton, explaining that she's going to the accident site and that the woman in their house is not her but a copy. Charton reads the note but dismisses it, believing it to be another of Grima's delusions. Inside the house, he is surprised by the unusually cheerful and affectionate demeanor of the copy. At the accident scene, Rachel is distressed by the couple's fate and concerned about her child. Grima reassures her that they didn't find a child's body at the site. Rachel shares the story of her son's accident three years ago and how he died. Gisli, unconvinced, leaves with his son. Grima believes these strange occurrences are linked to her and Yusa's return after a year. When Grima discusses these events with Derry, he reveals that Michael's return after three years parallels Issa's experience and he attributes these bizarre incidents to the massive volcano. He believes that the spirits of the dead are controlling their bodies and bringing them back to life. Grima is perplexed, as these events seem more complex than mere possessions. Derry decides to research further. Issei observes her father's frequent visits to Gunhild in the hospital. When he leaves, Issei asks Gunhild if she loves her father and Gunheld responds that she has never loved anyone as much as she loved Thor. Returning home, Grima discovers that her copy has rearranged the house and discarded old furniture that reminded her of their mother. Frustrated, she confronts her husband, Charton, accusing him of allowing the copy to make these changes. Charton insists that Grima needs psychiatric help due to her mental condition. Angered, Grima leaves. Einar calls Grima to inform her that the DNA analysis of the body is ready, urging her to come as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Gisli gives his wife painkillers to maintain her deteriorating condition and facilitate her death. He plans to live with the healthy copy once she passes away. Gisli visits the woman in the basement, assuring her that he will soon join her since she is his wife, Magnia. Derry, Determined to uncover the truth behind the volcanic events, decides to venture into the volcano's crater to collect a sample from the rock at the bottom of the glacier. As he descends, he witnesses corpses returning from the dead. Overwhelmed by fear, he hastily takes the sample and leaves the site. Not sharing the terrifying encounter with anyone, including his wife. Back at his laboratory, Derry carefully examines the rock sample becoming increasingly anxious. He gathers his team and informs them that the rock is unlike anything he has ever seen before. Derry reveals that the rock is the remnant of a meteorite that crashed on Earth from another solar system 2,000 years ago, causing the volcanic activity. Concerned about the implications of this discovery, 
the team decides to evacuate the area and seek refuge in a hotel as they realize that the region is full of samples of this unique rock, the effects of which are still unknown on the living. Meanwhile, Bjorn decides to travel to the Icelandic city of Vik after finding pictures of Thor with his mother. When he visits Thor's workshop, Thor immediately recognizes him as his son with Gunnald. However, he chooses not to reveal this information to Bjorn immediately. Thor contacts the original Gunnald and informs her of Bjorn's presence. During their meeting, the original Gunnheld confesses that 20 years ago, she was pregnant with Thor's child and contemplated an abortion but couldn't due to legal limitations. She expresses her guilt over possibly causing her son's disability during her pregnancy. Gunnheld apologizes to Thor for not revealing the truth earlier, fearing it would disrupt his family life with his wife and daughters. Back in Gisli's basement, he discovers that the clone virgin of his wife has escaped through a basement window. Grima, in the meantime, goes to collect the DNA analysis results from Einar, which confirm that the corpse is indeed Asaz. She shows the report to her husband, Charton, in an attempt to prove her sanity. However, upon returning home, Grima finds her husband in an intimate encounter with the other version of herself. Heartbroken and devastated, she leaves the house and goes to the other Issa by the sea, showing her the DNA analysis report. Realizing that she is a mere apparition, Asa decides to follow in her mother's footsteps and commits suicide by throwing herself into the sea. At midnight, Michael returns to the hotel and finds Rachel, appearing upset with her for leaving him in the middle of the road. As Derry and Rachel sit with Michael and explain what happened with the couple, Michael casually admits to killing them and causing the car accident. The couple becomes increasingly terrified and convinced that this child is not their son, Michael, due to his sinister behavior. Thor goes to the hospital to check on the cloned Gunheld's fetus. The doctor informs him that the fetus has a genetic syndrome that causes disability in all four limbs. Thor concludes that Gunheld's guilt over possibly causing her son's disability was unfounded, as it was a genetic condition. He decides to share this revelation with her, and for the first time, Gunhild feels relieved and free from the weight of guilt regarding her son's condition. On the following day, Derry and Rachel discuss their situation with Michael. The child calmly admits to killing the couple and causing the car accident. Realizing the danger and malevolence in this child, they become convinced that he is not their son, Michael. Thor, meanwhile, decides to inform his daughter, Grima, about her half-brother, Bijer, whom he plans to introduce to her. Grima shares with him the results of Asa's DNA analysis, explaining that the woman they encountered was not her sister. She reveals that Asa's clone virgin had returned to help her overcome her depression and accept her death, and once her mission was complete, she left. As for Gisli, he searches for his sick wife's clone virgin and believes she is in his wife's laundry. He indeed finds her there, but she outsmarts him, steals his car, and escapes with the original Magna. The original Gunhild contemplates returning to Sweden, but her son Bidura refuses to go with her. He wants to spend time with his family and asserts his independence, refusing to allow her to control his life any further. Derry and Rachel, realizing that Michael is not their son, stop the car, and Derry manages to convince the child to hand over the scalpel. They then hatch a sinister plan to get rid of him. They take him to the sea under the guise of playing, but their true intention is to drown him. As the narrative hurtles towards its climactic zenith, Grima's face-off with her doppelganger crackles with tension. The room becomes the battleground for their grievances, a crucible of emotions, and a test of their resilience. The gun, with its single fateful bullet, casts a chilling shadow over the table, a macabre proposition that hangs like a blade poised to fall. Einar, on the other hand, is thrust into a whirlpool of anguish as he unravels the harrowing truth about his father's sinister machinations. The revelation ignites a storm within him, fueled by betrayal and rage, 
and he confronts the architect of his mother's suffering with a relentless fury, leaving the man battered and bloodied in his wake. The original Gunheld embarks on her own poignant journey, one of self-discovery and redemption. Her visit to the vacant hospital room unveils the stark realization that her cloned counterpart was a messenger, a vessel of enlightenment, guiding her towards a path of self-acceptance and absolution. She emerges from this experience with newfound clarity, casting aside the burdens of guilt that had weighed heavily upon her. Gisli, overwhelmed by remorse, seeks solace in the embrace of the divine, a humble supplicant seeking forgiveness in the quiet sanctum of a church's hollowed walls. His desperate prayers are an invocation for redemption, a plea for absolution that hangs in the air like incense. Simultaneously, the tale takes a twist as Magnia's cloned incarnation slips through Gisli's grasp, evading his desperate attempts to maintain control. Her escape is a testament to the defiance of those who have been ensnared, a newfound strength to break free from the bonds of manipulation. In the midst of these tumultuous events, Bidur, Thor's estranged son, finds the fragile beginnings of familial reconnection, the slow mending of bridges, the tentative bonds formed, and the gradual integration into Thor's newfound family herald the promise of healing and unity. As the story unfolds, it leaves us in a space of contemplation, the characters' fates hanging in the balance, their paths still uncertain. The denouement of this enigmatic tale beckons us to reflect on the intricate tapestry of human existence, where redemption, forgiveness, and reconciliation can emerge from the most unexpected places, even amidst the shadows of the supernatural and the echoes of the past. As the story's final chapters unfold, the enigmatic events that have gripped the town of Vic take on an even more profound and mystifying dimension. The relentless eruption of the Kapla volcano, initially a harbinger of chaos and despair, now reveals a deeper purpose shrouded in mystery. With each resurrection, a cryptic message emerges from the ashes of the past. The returned, bearing the weight of their unresolved stories, are drawn together by forces beyond comprehension. Yet, once their message is conveyed, they vanish into obscurity, their presence leaving a profound mark on the few who witnessed their inexplicable return. The narrative, though it offers tantalizing hints and fragments of understanding, remains a puzzle with many pieces left unconnected. The questions linger, like shadows in the recesses of a haunted house, beckoning readers to explore the labyrinthine depths of human experience, the supernatural, and the uncharted territories of the soul. In the end, it is a story that challenges our perceptions of life, death, and the enduring mysteries of existence.